with that, great uh, precursor to our Nogus president, our Brigadier General Robinson. Uh, no introduction needed, sir. We appreciate you being here again this year. The floor is yours. about the coffee. I just got it. I don't want to turn loose. Uh, number one, thank you for inviting me. I think this is uh, the 10th conference that I've been at this year. And, and I really, I, I take it as a big part of my job to get out and, and go to as many state conferences as I, as I can possibly attend. There's nothing that I like better. I mean, I know, see, when the G3 of the Army comes in and, uh, and he brags on the state of Georgia, I hear that in 10 different states, and every time I do it, I want to stand up and beat my chest, and I'm from Mississippi. Uh, I mean that. Uh, the, things that the things that you do, I, I, just can't, I just can't say enough. I don't know whose idea it was to do the spouses forum this morning. I haven't seen that anywhere else. And I got to tell you, that was unbelievable. Um, I, I, I just... <laughs> I can't imagine that anybody didn't get a lot out of it, because I can assure you I did. I mean, I spent my entire adult life in the National Guard. That's, that's basically all I've ever done. Uh, but it did kind of bring to mind, you know, I've been married for 34 years. Uh, my wife's name is Susan. She's been a guard wife. In fact, the guard is the only thing that I've got that I had or that I got that I still have before I got her, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, but I got to thinking about it. So a couple of years ago, y'all know this, uh, the DNA thing where you send off to the DNA and they send back and they tell you all the different places in the world that you're from and, and they tell you how, what a mixed up society we are and that we're all one, no matter how you look at it. But anyway, we decided to do this, Susan and I. Now keep in mind, it was kind of interesting to me because I wasn't raised by my biological father. So was, I'm kind of curious sometimes. But Susan was raised by a guy who grew up on a farm in Illinois. Her mother is from Mobile. So you kind of think she's probably going to be central U.S., the whole kind of deal. Of course, I've been living with her for 34 years. And I know that there are some, uh, there, there are some uh, kind of families out there where when they blow up, they really have tempers that you just can't believe are coming out of this five foot two, 110 pound person. So we send them off and we get them back and we're kind of eager, you know, we, we get them together and we sit down and we open them up. And uh, of course, all of you know, Italians are known for having a temper, right? We agree on that. So we open these things up and Susan's evidently she's got some pretty strong traces from Italy in her DNA. And she was really surprised by that. She was, hey, you know, I can't really understand that. And, you know, and I'm thinking on the military side, you know, we're always thinking on one side of our brain and talking out of the other side of their brain. And, and I'm sitting here looking her straight in the eye and I'm trying to figure out how in the hell I'm gonna respond to this without getting a taste of what I knew was already there. So, on the one side, I'm thinking, how can you not know that you got some Italian in you? Have you ever seen yourself when you're at supersonic? You know what I mean? And on the other side, the only thing I could, I could spit out was, you, you've always made great spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> and I kid you not, that's an absolute true story. And it kind of, when the spouses were down here telling their stories of what they've done with the, both the active force and the guard, it really struck a chord, uh, I tell you. Uh, if you haven't done it, if you haven't lived it, you may not have the, the proper respect and understanding for what spouses go through when we're off doing all the, all the things that we get lost and go do occasionally. So I never want to forget them. Uh, corporate partners, thank you for being here. If you haven't been around and spoke to them, you need to. I'm not sure, even though I was the executive director in Mississippi for nine years before I went up to D.C. to take over in August, even there, 
I'm not sure I had the right level of respect for the participation that the corporate partners do throughout the 54 states and territories and at the national level. What they bring to the table financially, number one, we would never be able to have the events and have the professional development sessions that we have without the support of the corporate partners. And, and a, lot of the, a lot of the things and the tools and the, and, and the technology that they bring to bear, our young officers and soldiers and airmen would never be exposed to if it was not for these, this group of individuals that travel all over the 54 states and territories making sure that all of our people are aware of the latest and greatest technology, and that's part of what we do, making sure they have the best that they can possibly, the best that we can get them as they go forward to do the th do, to fight on, uh, on behalf of the nation. So thank you. Thank you for what you do. Um, so is, is AFBA still in the room, or I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, be proud of your leadership. Uh, I go, all over, I go all over the country. I interact with adjutant generals from, from a lot of different states, and they're all great Americans, and they're wonderful patriots, and I have just a, a unique amount of respect for everything they do. But you need to know, you've got one that leads the pack. Uh, he, he, is, uh, he certainly is well-respected and listened to by his peers at the national level. He has a unique approach that I think is, is, is very positive on what we try to do, even in the association business. He currently serves on our, on our board of directors. I got to tell you, his driver was a little off yesterday, just to be honest with you. Uh, but, but you really should be proud of the leadership that you have appointed here in Georgia and, and the other leaders that, that, that surround him. Um, so AFBA. State-sponsored life insurance. I see Marshall sitting over here. Uh, most of you don't realize it, but when I came into the executive director business in Mississippi, there was one guy that literally took me under his wing and became a very close friend uh, in a short period of time, and that's Marshall. And to this day, we continue to talk. The things that he does for the association here in Georgia, my hat's off to you, Marshall, and I appreciate what you do. Uh, we go back to the executive director spent a lot of their time on the state-sponsored life insurance program. I want to convey a story to you. I do see, there's Chemo and Cynthia back there. Y'all raise your hand so they know who I'm talking about. All of you know what state-sponsored life insurance is, right? Everybody know what that is? So it is insurance that the association provides uh, or makes available to the airmen and the soldiers in the National Guard. And it's got a, a, unique, a unique thing to it in that they actually write the family a check within 24 hours of the death of the service member. So you think, you think well, okay, so what? Let me tell you something. Uh, I was a, a state employee, a federal technician, AGR, and a traditional guy. I stood in front of a bunch of formations in the Mississippi National Guard. There are very strong, good, patriotic, hardworking soldiers and airmen in the National Guard throughout our ranks that if something happened to the major breadwinner on Monday, they would probably have a difficult time figuring out how to buy groceries on Friday. And that's just the world that we live in. So as a commander, I always thought, you know what, there's two kind of commanders. There's a commander that goes out after a bad thing happens and he puts his arm around the spouse and he says, hey, we're with you. We appreciate, we appreciate the service of your loved one. And then there's the commander who ensured that all of his airmen and all of his soldiers was covered with the state-sponsored life insurance. And he goes out there with a forty-five dollars or $50,000 check and he hugs the spouse and he says, you know, this is probably the most difficult time you'll go through in your life. Financial responsibility should not be a burden today, and he gives them that check. I'm telling you, I've actually delivered some of those checks. It's huge, uh, the impact it has. But I, I, I kind of want to tell a little bit of a story. I was actually at another conference. Um, I, was, I was involved in, I wasn't supposed to be on it, but I heard a conference call that one of the senior executives with AFBA was participating in. It was right after the C-130 went down, the Puerto Rican C-130, it went down, 
And uh, of course, they had some, some airmen that were killed. They had all their senior executives on one phone call. It was, it was literally the day after. All their senior executives were on one phone call. They had the president, General Eberhardt, of Armed Forces Benefit Association. They had the president, Mark Singleton, of Five Star Life. But all of them were on one, one phone conversation, one conference call. They, I never heard a single comment about the impact of the insurance checks that were fixed and be written, the business impact on the company itself. It was about a 20-minute discussion by the senior executives at that company, and all they were focused on, how is it, what is the fastest, most efficient way for us to physically get checks to the families of these members in Puerto Rico? It had an impact on me. Let me tell you something. There's not a lot of insurance companies out there that that would be their number one thought. So I just say that. I'm very grateful for what they do. They do it for the National Guard all over the country. Thank you all. Uh, it's, it's not missed. And, uh, and we're just very appreciative of what you do for, for the families. Okay. A couple of things we got going. Uh, anybody familiar with the uh, FedRec legislation that's currently working its way through Congress? So let me tell you. If you're, if you're out there as a lieutenant or a captain or a major, or even a lieutenant colonel in, some, in some, uh, some areas, if you're not focused in on this legislation like a laser, then you're not paying attention. It's huge. You know, I, I actually, I was a product and got promoted several times before ROTMA went into effect in the mid-90s. Um, it, it's, a, it's a problem that we have got to overcome. You know, these these young officers are going out and doing things that are unbelievable. I mean, they're literally CTC rotations. I mean, you guys are familiar with that. NTC rotations, deployments, three or four times out the door. And then to bring them back, promote them into a higher grade position, and take a year or more to get federal recognition on that promotion? It's insane. I got to tell you. And I think it's important to note, and I wish you would share it with your company grade officers, there was not another military service organization in Washington, D.C. that was working this issue but Dongus. And that's a fact. Um, it took about four months to get the legislation drafted. Um, they wound up being able to drop the legislation in a fairly short period of time. Uh, the House Armed Services Committee, in their markup two weeks ago now, actually adopted the entire language. We don't know exactly what's going to happen to it on the, on the Senate side because the Senate markup is still kind of uh, in a sequester state. We should know something next week. But I can tell you, your, your officers and your formations are very interested in this subject. Uh, we did a little video. Three weeks later, we had over 27,000 views of the video that outlined the FedRec legislation. So I, my only commitment to you, we're doing everything that we can possibly do to make sure that this legislation becomes law, and it, and it does that in, in a timely manner to where our officers don't have to wait and wait and serve in, the, in positions where they're not, they're not wearing the rank that they ought to be ranking. I'm an Army guy. I get that. So we're working on it. I'm very hopeful, not 100%, uh, to be honest with you. We actually have had a little bit of pushback from the Department of Defense. Uh, if you could imagine, they non-concurred with the legislation. Uh, don't laugh out loud. I know that's hard to believe sometimes, but truly, I mean, how, how would you possibly, they're, they're saying that it kind of encroached on their authority on the promotion of officers. I read the non-concur language. They're good people. It's not their fault. They just don't understand the difference in the process of promoting a National Guard officer as opposed to a reserve or an active officer. It's a different process, and they don't have experience in that. So we're going to continue to work it. I, I, think, I think we're going to be able to, to do some good. 12304 Bravo, I think I talked to you about it last year. It's done. I think we're good. The only thing we're lacking is the retirement credit. Uh, we're trying. We put that in this year. I'm not, I'm not very confident that we're going to get that through, but I can tell you this, we're not going to forget it. We're going to continue to bang on it. I really can't say enough good things about what's going on overall with the Army and Air Force. 
We got F 35s going to air wings. We've got uh, KC 46s. Got a little hiccup there, but we still have some going to air wings. Um, you see the kind of integration that the Army's getting out with, uh, with the National Guard. I mean, the G3, he laid it out for you. I don't know that we could ask for a better briefing from one of the key members of the Chief of the Staff's Army, st of his senior staff. I thought it was phenomenal. I I'm all in. I think it's great. So I do need to caution you just a little bit. Um, we do interact with the Department of Defense, with the Army, with the Air Force. Um, and I think that no, there's, there's, no, there's no severe rub there. I mean, the only way I know to tell you is tell you what happened. I got called over to the Pentagon about a week ago. I actually met with the uh, Secretary of the Army, Chief Staff of the Army, Vice Chief Staff of the Army, Chief of the Bureau, and, uh, and the Director of the Army National Guard. And it, it was a good discussion, and it was very positive. And it was about the fielding of new equipment to Army National Guard units and, and, uh, and, and why there was kind of a hiccup there. And what I found out is what came out of the discussion was actually something good for us, information-wise. So the leadership of the Army disagrees with concurrent and proportional fielding. They disagree, and that's okay. As an association and as a, as a National Guard, we, we get to have an opinion too. And we believe that all of the components, the active, the guard, and the reserve, should be fielded concurrently and proportional with new equipment as the Congress puts the money out to upgrade and to modernize the different, the different components. So it's okay. I mean, we all shook hands, we smile, we walk away. It, it's fine. It's just important that we note that we disagree on something that's very, very important to the National Guard. And it doesn't matter if you're an Apache pilot. It doesn't matter if it, it affects Blackhawks in every state in the nation. Um, it's going to continue to affect other platforms. You think about where we are in some of the tanks and the Bradleys and some of the other weapon systems that, uh, that we deal with, if we're not fielding the newest and best solutions that industry brings to us across the three components, then it doesn't take very long to see that curve and you begin to attrit. And we have had that happen in the history of the National Guard. Uh, there was a little uh, skirmish called the Korean conflict. And if you go back and read about it, you'll see that we allowed that, we allowed our readiness to a trit. And we allowed the equipment that we were trying to do the jobs with to significantly a trit. Now, the Army has a plan, and God bless them. I mean, they're all great patriots. And if their plan works out perfectly, then we're okay. But you know, I think if you look historically, the plan never seems to work out exactly like we lay it out. And the Army's getting a heck of a value. You know, everybody refers to us as an operational reserve. And, and, and we are. We're an operational combat reserve. And I love that. But the other thing they're getting out of us, basically at no cost, is a really, really, really bad day strategic reserve on the part of this country. And what I'm here to tell you, if we don't have the same equipment with the same level of sophistication and it's not issued out to all of those components the strategic the strategic implications of that over the long term with a couple of short term decisions that didn't go very well could be very severe on the part of this country so that's what we do it in august we're going to continue to have this discussion you know, if you, you heard the congressman say the actual authority for raising the Army is where? It's in the Congress. And it just happens that a lot of the members of the Congress believe in concurrent and proportional fielding. So we're going to have to work a little harder, try to get to a better place with the Army staff. This is, you know, that's the great thing. That's what I try to convey to them sometimes. 
If you look out here at the operational level where you guys are interacting with the Army and the Air Force on a daily basis, you're deploying all over the world, there's no issues there. It works. It works 100% of the time. Occasionally, when you have leaders in key positions that don't necessarily agree with the landscape and they don't necessarily agree with some of the tribulations that we've been through in our history as a National Guard, we have to spend our time educating and bringing them along and going over to the Congress to make sure they understand kind of what we're trying to accomplish and where we are on these issues. You know, I, J Stars is a great example. If you believe that all of the, the best and brightest solutions to all of the problems that are identified are in Washington, D.C., God bless you. Because that's just not the case. Most of the issues that come up to us at August that we work on, they come from the 54. Most of the solutions to the issues that come up at August, they come from the 54. And that's what we're built about. That's why we have all the state associations that are in touch with all of the members who are out there on the tip of the spear doing the, doing the hard stuff every day. Um, I don't know where J-STARS is going to wind up. Uh, I'm, I know that uh, your Adjutant General is, is working hard on it. Uh, I hope that it comes out to be a positive thing for the Georgia National Guard and the Air Force. And I think, I think time will tell. It's actually been very close hold on some of the communications back and forth. So, you know, and, and we still, at August, we take our cues from you. You know, we're not, we're not going to go out and take stands that are contrary to what you think is best for the state of Georgia. And J-STARS is the same thing. I mean, as we drive forward and, and you decide kind of where we need to be, we're going to be there. We're going to be having those conversations. But we're not going to get out in front of what Joe Girard thinks is best for the state of Georgia and the Georgia National Guard. Um, so I have, to, I have to mention a little bit, uh, I guess, Ingus broke out to a separate session. I'm very pleased with Ingus being in the building. And I, I got to tell you, and I know Joe Hargett worked with him all the time. If y'all don't realize it, I carry Gus Hargett with me everywhere I go. He, he's like my American Express. I don't leave home without him. Uh, in all seriousness, he's been, a, he's been a great friend. He's been a great mentor. You know, there are a lot of discussions that I get involved in in Washington, D.C. that I need to have input and experience uh, kind of put into my head before I go into some of these confrontations. And I got to say, Gus, number one, thank you for doing it. But you all need to know he's, he is constantly in communication with me. We talk all the time. He's staying in touch with the issues. And uh, he is an unbelievable uh, force multiplier. For, for this National Association, sir, and I mean that. Thank you. So I got to say, uh, just a little bit about membership. When I come to town, you know you're going to get it. Uh, you know, it, it's very difficult out there. I think uh, when I was in Mississippi, we were 100% state for so many years. You know, everybody just assumed that you're going to stay 100% state. You know, it just happens. Well, I can tell you, it doesn't just happen. It happens when leaders are engaged and when we're talking to our young leaders and they understand the long-term implications of not having a very strong, robust, respected voice on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. If you ever, and I've seen it, I've, I've seen it over several different states. If you ever get to the point to where you were 100% state and you allow yourself to drop down, man, it is a hard slog to get back up, to get back in the green. I'm just telling you. It's, it's one of those deals where if the train's moving a little bit, you need to keep pushing and push hard because if the train ever stops, it gets a lot harder to get it going again. And I mean that. I know Marshall... He's doing everything that he can do. I know you got good leadership, and they talk about the association. Let's make sure we're having the right conversations with our junior leaders. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be very careful about splitting our priorities. I want to go out, and I want to work about half of our time 
on equipping issues. When, when, when you, as members of the National Guard of any state, when we put you on an aircraft, I take it as a personal responsibility that we've done everything we can do as an association to make you the best equipped soldier and airman in the entire Department of Defense. I believe that. And I believe that's our charter, and I believe that's what we ought to do. I think the other part of our time, probably about half of it, ought to be about taking care of the members that we have that are out there doing the hard things. It ought to be about making sure you get all the benefits that you're entitled to, to you and your family when you go and do these hard jobs. It ought to be about promotions. It ought to be about personnel stuff to make sure that we're hitting all the right buttons to keep those young officers interested in what it is that we do. You know, it, it's not that hard to turn an eight-year career into a 30-year career. As most of you know, at about 15 years, you lose track of time anyway. And you wake up, and all of a sudden somebody tells you you've been in 33 years, you need to go find something to do on the weekends. So I'm just saying from the Naugus perspective, we're trying to track that way. We're trying to split it. We don't want to get overload on the equipping side. And we want to make sure we're doing right by our members in terms of the personnel type issues that we want to work through. And I commit to you, we're going to continue. So I give it, this is actually a working document. This is the April issue of the National Guard Association of U.S. Magazine. Is there anybody in the audience that doesn't recognize this magazine or didn't receive it at your home address? You can raise your hand at this point. Yeah, y'all know what I'm doing, don't you? So I'm going to make it easy. If you didn't get your copy, you need to go see Marshall. Because that means that you probably are not in the current status that you need to be in support of your national organization. And there's another thing that we put in, it, in here this year that, you know, I, I can't tell you the importance of when you talk to your congressional delegation, when your leadership talks to, to your congressional delegation, and I go and have a conversation with your congressional delegation, or my lead staff goes and has a conversation with your congressional delegation, I can't, I can't tell you the importance of us saying the same thing. I mean to the point of using the same verbiage. The credibility and the effectiveness of our interaction with the Congress goes through the roof when we're talking the exact same language. And that's why we put these cards. I know in, your, in, your, in most of your auto magazines, I'm a car nut, I get a bunch of auto magazines, and every time they come, they have about four renewal cards in them. This is not a renewal card. But what this is, it's a very simple and concise list of what we got accomplished in 2018. And on the back side, it's what we're attempting to accomplish in 2019. So I'm kind of an old school guy. I take this out and I put it on my desk or I put a tape it to my laptop or whatever it is that I'm using. You know, there's a lot of good, where are the lawyers at? Yeah, I'm glad y'all are sitting here. That's good. I got my eye on you. So there's a lot of good, very honorable and legal conversations that you can have that will begin with this one card. You know, the truth is, I don't mind the lawyers. It's not about breaking arms or cracking heads or affecting, or, or affecting your careers. It's not about that anymore. We don't, we don't do that. And to be honest with you, nobody does that. Um, but it is an expectation of buying into the career path and, the, uh, and what we do as a National Guard. And I think you have to convey it. And we, you hear about these generational things where well, this generation, they just don't, don't believe all that. These kids are just as good as any of us ever were. They fight just as hard as any of us ever did. And they'll support in August just as strongly as any of us ever did if you're willing to have the conversations that lets them understand what it is that Naugus does. I get that. I was on, uh, I'm about out of time, aren't I, Reggie? Okay, so I was, on, I was on a tank range, not a tank range, I was actually on a Bradley range in 1985 as a young infantry platoon leader going through new equipment training. And uh, 
you know, I was a member of the association. I was a member of the National Association. I mean, that's just what I did, but I was really focused on my platoon and doing what we needed to do. We were at Fort Benning, in fact. And at the time, when we drove those brand new Bradley fighting vehicles out to the range, and we mounted up, keep in mind, we, we had come out of 113s. This was literally a generation skipping type thing. But when we drove those Bradleys up, you know, I was sitting there. And I was I was a guard kid. What I did, I was looking at those brand new Bradleys lined up across that range at Fort Benning, and they all had National Guard numbers on the back of them. And at the time, I was just like some of your lieutenants and some of your captains. I thought, man, this Army is great. They are a nice bunch of guys. They sent us all this new equipment, and it just happened. Over experience and a little more time, I have learned that nothing just happens. It happens because of people like, at the time, Sonny Montgomery and several others, I'm sure from the state of Georgia, that were deeply involved and cared about the guard. We've got those same friends in Washington, D.C. today. And the purpose of what we do is to make sure that they understand what our needs are. And I continue to carry that flag. I got to tell you, uh, I, I do miss being in uniform. There's no question about it. Uh, the 155 is out at Fort Bliss. It, it just absolutely kills my soul to see them out there for about the first 10 or 15 minutes. And every time I think about this, this pit that I'm in in Washington, D.C., you know, I, I sold a retirement home down at Fairhope, Alabama on the bay to move to Washington, D.C. to a two-bedroom apartment. But every time I think, about, I think about those guys and what I'm doing in Washington, D.C., I remember back to my trips to the National Training Center, to the time that I spent in Iraq deployed out in Anbar province. You know, this, uh, this job is a lot more than a job. This is a lifelong passion for me. This is what I do. This is what... I, you know, when you guys get tired of me, I'm going to go play golf down in South Alabama. But uh, it's the greatest job I've ever had is carrying your banner up on, on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for all your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Thank you always. Always a pleasure. Absolutely.